the cynicism of state and hegemonic power. Quoting the testament of an aristocrat, and pardon here for my terrible French, je n'ai rien, je dois beaucoup, je donne le reste au pauvre. Quoting Ernst Toller from his 1993 book Eine Jugend in Deutschland. Does an emperor go to the toilet? I think about the question a lot and run to mother. You'll end up in prison, says mother. So, he doesn't go to the toilet. Quoting Stanley Baldwin, British Prime Minister, 1936. War and preparation for war go together with tricks of diplomacy, the suspension of moral concepts, holidays for truth, and a field day for cynicism. The subjects of political reality, states and monarchical powers, can be compared with what the heroes were in military reality. The further back we go in history, the more similar the images of heroes and kings become, until they merge in the idea of heroic monarchy. In ancient times, many monarchical houses and emperors traced their lines of descent directly to the gods. In old traditions, the ascent through heroic achievements to monarchy had to be complemented by a divine descent, as descendancy from the divine. One became king, on the one hand, through heroic power, and on the other through God's grace, earned from below through triumphs, illuminated from above by a cosmic legitimation. One cannot say of the early monarchies that they were meek in their public self-portrayal. Everywhere noble rule, monarchy and state were established, and intensive training and arrogance began in the ruling families. Only in this way could the consciousness of standing at the summit be consolidated in the psyches of the powerful. Grandiosity thus became a political psychic style. The leap from power to grandeur, from the naked superiority of force to sovereign glory was made. The primeval kings, pharaohs, despots, kaisers and princes secured their self-confidence by means of a charismatic symbolism. A functionally useful megalomania was at work in the monarchies, i.e. grandiosity as a structural factor in domination. Through their renown, princes staked out their symbolic duties, uh, symbolic domains, and only through this renown, the medium of media, do we today know of the existence of many a realm of the name and of the names of their rulers. To this extent, the luminescence of ancient kingly arrogance has not quite died out, even to the present day. Not only did Alexander the Great carry his name as far as India, he expanded it through a medium of traditions into the depths of time. Around many a power and ruler a radiant crown forms, emanating energy for millennia. With the emergence of such lofty political symbolic positions, however, the scene was also set for the process of the cynicism of power to be put into motion. Of course, here too from below through the provocation of the splendid hegemonic power from the cheeky position of a slave. The subjects of the first political cynicism were therefore people who were led into or threatened with slavery, people who were oppressed but whose self-consciousness was not completely destroyed. For them it was natural to view the arrogant poses of superior power without awe, and in doing so to recall the devastation and massacres the victor inflicted before he could strut around so. In the slave's eyes, the reduction of the king's right to pure force and of majesty to brutality had already begun. The inventors of the original political kinicism were the Jewish people. In quote-unquote our civilization, they have provided the most powerful model to date of resistance against violent superior powers. Cheeky, resolute, militant, and capable of suffering at the same time, they are, or were, the Eulenspiegel 
and the Schweik among peoples. To the present day in Jewish wit, something of the original kinical twist of oppressed sovereign consciousness lives on. A reflective flash of melancholy knowledge that slyly, insolently and alertly positions itself against powers and presumptions. Whenever the Israelite dwarf has once again been once again beaten the modern Goliath, an irony of three thousand years lights up in the victor's eyes. How unfair, David! As a result, the descendants of Adam were the first to have eaten of the tree of political knowledge, and it appears to have been a curse. For with the secret of self-preservation in one's head, one risks being sentenced, like Ahazva, to not being able to live or die. During the greater part of their history, the Jews were forced to lead a life that was survival on the defensive. The political kinicism of the Jews is borne by the knowledge, both ironic and melancholy, that everything passes, even tyrannies, even oppressors, and that only immutable and that the only immutable thing is the pact between the chosen people and their God. Therefore, in a certain respect, the Jews can be held to be the inventors of political identity. It is a faith that, inwardly invincible and unshakable, has known how to defend its continued existence through the millennia with cynical renunciation and an ability to suffer. The Jewish people were the first to discover the power of weakness, patience and sighing. Their survival, in a millennium of military conflicts and always in the weaker position, depended on this power. The significant break in Jewish history, the dispersion after 134 AD with which the age of the Diaspora began, led to a change in the model figure for the small, valiant people. The first half of Jewish history stood under the sign of David, who defied Goliath and passed into history as the first representative of a realistic kingdom without exaggerated glory. In threatening times, the people could learn their political ego, could lean their political ego on this majestic Eulenspiegel and hero figure. From him stemmed an alternative image of the hero, the humanized heroism of the weaker who stands his ground when resisting a superior power. From Judaism, the world inherited the idea of resistance. This idea lived on in the Jewish people as the messianic tradition, which, full of hope, anticipated the promised holy king from the house of David, who would lead their unhappy people out of all turmoil to themselves once again, to their home, their dignity, their freedom. According to Flavius Josephus's account, The Jewish War, Jesus was nothing more than one of numerous messianic critics of the authorities and religious guerrillas who had proclaimed their resistance to Roman domination. From the Roman conquest of Palestine until the collapse of the Bar Kokhba, Bar Kokhba? uprising in 135 AD, Messianism must have been truly epidemic on your Jewish soil. The charismatic rebel, Simeon bar Kotzeba, son of the stars, like Jesus, had claimed that he was a descendant of David. With Jesus and the consolidation of the Christ religion, the David tradition was continued in new dimensions. While the Jewish people were being beaten and driven from their homeland, and were entering the bitter second half of their history, in which Ahazva might be their model figure rather than David, Christianity continued the Jewish resistance against the Roman Empire on another level. At first Christianity became a significant school of resistance, courage and embodied faith. If it had been then what it is today in Europe, it would not have lasted 50 years. During the period of the Roman emperors, Christians formed the nucleus of inner resistance. To be a Christian once meant not allowing oneself to be impressed by earthly powers, and especially not by the arrogant, violent and amoral Roman god-emperors. 
whose religious political manoeuvres were all too transparent. Early Christianity may have been helped by this, may have been helped in this by having inherited from the Jews that historicizing kinicism that knew how to, how to say to all bearers of power and fame and imperial pretension, we have already seen a dozen of your sort perish. Hyenas and almighty time, which obeys only our God, have been gnawing for a long time on the bones of earlier despots. The same fate awaits you. The Jewish idea of history thus contains political dynamite. It discovers the transitoriness of others' empires. The primary theoretical, cynical, cynical consciousness, cynical too because in alliance with the more powerful principle, i.e. historical truth and God, is the historical consciousness. I'll read that again without the parentheses. The primary theoretical, cynical, cynical consciousness is the historical consciousness that so many powerful and grandiose empires have decayed into dust and ashes in Jewish consciousness. Have decayed into dust and ashes, full stop. In Jewish consciousness, historical knowledge becomes the narration of the downfall of others and of its own miraculous survival. From the Jews, the early Christians inherited a knowledge of what it was like in the hearts of the oppressors, a knowledge of the hubris of naked power. In the tenth psalm, Jewish consciousness puts itself in the interior of evil power and eavesdrops on its haughty conversation with itself. Verse 2 Because the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor, let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. Verse 3, for the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. In verse 6, he hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Lost my page. The Jewish Kinnock follows the invulnerability fantasies of military despots into their innermost marrow. There he speaks his denial. He will not be among those who praise the powerful rulers. Since that time, despots have to live with this torment. There will always be a group that takes no part in deifying the powerful. This is how the psycho-political dynamics of the quote-unquote Jewish question function. Jewish cynical consciousness feels on its own beaten and burned skin the violent nature, Gewalt Fessen, of glory and splendour. The back that has counted the lashes will, it is true, bow down because that is the smarter thing to do. But there will be an irony in its bowing that drives those hungry for greatness into a rage. In the tension between hegemonic powers and the oppressed, two positions thus initially present themselves here. The splendid power, with its pompous facade. There, the immediate experience slaves have of the violent core of power and of the facade of pomp. A midpoint between the two is established through the political legal achievements of the hegemonic power, from which it draws its legitimation. At this midpoint, the achievement of law and state, the consciousness of the master and the slave can meet. To the extent hegemonic power legitimates itself through a good exercise of power, it overcomes its initially violent character and can find its way back into a relative innocence, namely to exercise the art of the possible in a world of necessities. Where hegemonic power really legitimates itself, it subjects itself to a higher and more universal interest, to the support and continuance of life. For this reason, peace, justice and protection of the weak are the holy words of politics. Where a hegemonic power can justifiably say of itself that it has furthered peace, brought forth justice, and made the protection of the most fragile life its noblest cause. There it begins to overcome in its own core of violence and to earn a higher legitimacy. But here more than anywhere else, 
the words must be measured against reality. As a rule, the language of power changes the meaning of expressions. It calls the postponement of war peace. It says creation of order when it suppresses unrest. It boasts about its social mindedness when it has handed out arms that are mere window dressing. And it says justice when it administers laws. The dubious justice of power is reflected in Anatole France's great sarcastic remark. The law, in its elevated equality, forbids beggars and millionaires alike to sleep under bridges. The political original sin, the bloody, violent and extortionary beginnings of domination, can only be overcome through legitimation in the sense just described and purified through broad assent. If this fails, the violent core of hegemonic power resurfaces unveiled. This occurs continually in legalised form through the exercise of the punitive force that intervenes whenever the law of hegemonic powers is broken. Punishment is thus the Achilles' heel of the legality of violence. Anyone who observes hegemonic powers as they punish learns at the same time something of their essence and his or her own, their core of violence and his or her attitude toward it. Just as cowards have to hide themselves in the mass of hesitators, the subversive consciousness of slaves keeps itself alive by learning the language of slaves, of acknowledgement, of the illusion of legality and glorification, so well that the ironic tone is not immediately perceived. The Roman Petronius, if tradition portrays him accurately, is supposed to have been a genius at servile irony. In his encounter with the arrogance of Nero, he carried the art of scathingly ironic flattery to an extreme. He knew how to serve his poisoned veneration to his majesty in such sweet compliments that power could not restrain itself from swallowing them. Of course, for the ironic, self-aware patrician in the age of the emperors, there remained in the end no other way than to consciously die. This savoir mourir, which knowingly calculates its own death as the possible final price for freedom, links the disempowered but proud Roman patriciate with Christianity, which over the centuries had grown into the greatest provocation to the Caesars. And with it emerged a consciousness of existential sovereignty that, even more than Stoic ethics, neutralised the question of whether one stood at the top, or the middle, or at the bottom of society. Under its sign, slaves could become more fearless of death than the masters. The power of embodiment in early Christianity was so strong that in the end, it won the greatest power structure in the ancient world over to its side. It had its roots in the consciousness of freedom that emerges when the naive veneration of power ceases. It nev to never again be forced to respect a mere worldly, external, violent power. This became the clinical core in the Christian atti attitude toward hegemonic power. Friedrich Schlegel was one of the Christian. Friedrich Schlegel was one of the first modern thinkers to again achieve a clear picture of the clinical, cynical quality of radically embodied Christianity. In his Athenaeum's Fragmenta of 1798, he noted, if the essence of cynicism consists in having an absolute contempt for all political splendour, then Christianism is probably nothing other than universal cynicism. The truth of this thesis is shown in the way that splendid Roman state met and reflected the clinical Christian challenge. At first, the Roman state had no alternative than to suffocate with brutal force the self-aware light that irradiated it, and demonstrated by the waves of persecution of Christians over the centuries, as demonstrated 
when these were unsuccessful and the power of embodiment in the new faith grew with repression, there occurred, after three centuries of friction, a turn in world history. Imperial power submitted to Christian kinicism in order to tame it. This is the significance of the Constantinian turning point. With it, the Christianization of power began, and herewith viewed structurally the refraction of the cynical impulse into cynicism. Since Constantine, the history of nation states in Europe is essentially the history of Christianized state cynicism that, after this epoch making change of positions, did not cease to dominate and afflict political reflection in the form of a schizoid master's ideology. This, by the way, is, initially, not a theme that would require a psychology of the unconscious. The divisions discussed here run through consciousness to consciousnesses to the surface. The power cannot become <clears throat> that power cannot become pious appears to those ruling not in nocturnal bad dreams, but rather in their daily calculations. There is no unconscious conflict between the ideals of faith here and the morality of power there, but from the beginning a limited faith. With this, the cynicism of hegemonic power counterposes itself to the cynical impulse of oppositional power. The former already begins as doublethink. Christian doublethink reached its first peak in the Augustinian philosophy of history that, despairingly realistic and confronted with the decayed monster of the Christianized Roman Empire, saw no other way out than to make a comprehensive program out of splitting of reality and implicitly out of the splitting of reality and implicitly of morality. Thus arises the fatally realistic doctrine of the two realms, de duibus civitatibus, the divine realm, civitas dei, and the temporal realm, civitas terrena, which are conspicuously embodied in the Catholic Church and the Roman Empire. The temporal organization of the Church as an appendage of the divine spheres reaches down to earth, with this, dualisms are described from which there have been no definitive break either in the history of European nation-states or in philosophical thought concerning the state. Even in the 20th century, state and church stand in a conflict-laden relationship as accomplices and contracting parties. The thousand-year-old wrangle between state and church provides the picture book of pugilism illustrating all positions, holds, throws, hugs and scissors that are possible between two wrestlers whom fate is wound inseparably together. Not even on the surface can the Christianized state organize itself as a unified entity, aside from Byzantinian Christianity. According to its inner and outer structure, it has long since been condemned to being two-faced and to splitting truth. Thus a double system of law, church law and state law, a double culture, spiritual and worldly, and even a double politics, church politics and state politics, develop. In these doublings is hidden something of the secret of the rhythm of Western European history, which produced the bloodiest, most disruptive, most conflict-laden, but at the same time the most creative and fastest history that has ever taken place in such a relatively short time on such a small continent. The cynical, cynical logic of conflict is one of the forces or laws the tumultuous process of the history of European states. Yeah, let me say, try that again. The cynical, cynical logic of conflict is one of the forces or laws that drive the tumultuous process of the history of European states, classes and cultures to its unequalled brilliance. <clears throat>
Almost from the beginning, everything is doubled here. A mighty potential for antitheses, ripe for execution, for embodied powers of reflection, and for armed convictions. Here, we do not want to get into historiography. A few catchwords may illustrate the tensions just described as they developed. As is well known, the bishopric of Rome, with its provincial dependencies, was the only parastate structure that survived the disintegration of the Western Roman Empire. Around 500 AD, Christianity conquered the new northern European group of powers when Regimus of Rhymes succeeded in christening the Frankish Merovingian chief Clodvig, Clovis. For this reason, even today the French church proudly calls itself Phil Aene de l'Eglise, the eldest daughter of the church. That Schlodwig himself was incidentally also one of the wiliest and most bestial and power-hungry figures of early European history, surely of the same stuff as a Genghis Khan or Tamerlane, only with le lesser means, may be taken as a hint of what could be expected from Christianized monarchical powers. To live with a schism in one's head became the fundamental problem of Christian domination. Moreover, as a last consequence, the doctrine of Christianity had to split itself, namely into a doctrine for half and whole Christians, for split and intact Christians. This tendency, of course, has already begun in the times of persecution, when Christian communities started to polarise into religious elites, saints, martyrs, priests, and ordinary Christians. The schizoid development of Christianity can be explained essentially through three great movements. First, transformation of religion from a way of life for communities to the metaphysical dress rehearsal of ruling powers, that is, through the structuring of religious politics. Second, through the establishment of spiritual governments in the form of papal, episcopal and monastical abbeys and priories, landed dominions, and third, through the forced and superficial Christianization of the broad population. The canonical core of Christianity also presents itself in a threefold way, when, still under the sign of Christian domination, it resists mere domination and tries to live against the splits, first in the great orders of Western monasticism, which, since Benedict of Nursia, carried on the synthesis of prayer and labour, and later too in the contemplative and ascetic movements of the high middle ages. Second, in the heretics who unrelentingly filed suit for the embodiment of the Christian commandment to love, and frequently became martyrs in the Christian persecution of Christians. Third, in the attempts of some Christian monarchs to bridge the tensions between the worldly office and Christian doctrine through a priestly humanitarianism, we will leave aside the Christian, the question of the extent to which this could succeed. Charlemagne cynically and brutally pursued his Frankish imperialist politics in the name of Christianity, for which reason he is rightly called the father of the Occident. The Ottonians and Salians developed the business of political rule by means of churchmen so thoroughly that under them the bishoprics became the supporting struts of German imperial politics. C.F. The imperial program of the High Middle Ages, the Christian and Germanically transformed idea of empire and emperor, and the political duels between the monarchy and the papacy. The eight great European Crusades can probably be understood only against this background. What happened between 1096 and 1270 under the concept of Crusada constituted an attempt of the Christianized feudal dominions to act out their master's cynicism of their own consciousness, which had become unbearable. After centuries of Christianization, 
and the religious commandments had created a matrix of internalizations in the ruling military aristocratic strata that then intensified the contradiction between the Christian commandment to love and the feudal ethics of war to the point of bursting. The unbearable pressure of the contradictions which had become internalized explains the violence with which for centuries Europeans could pour their energies into the pathological idea of the crusade. The crusades, proclaimed to be holy wars, were socio-psychological explosions of a proto-fascist quality. They channeled the energies that had been blocked in the conflict between two mutually negating ethics in the individual and the collective soul. In the holy war, the opposition of a religion of love and an ethics of heroism that could be lived out turned into a call that could be lived out. In the holy war, the opposition of a religion of love and an ethics of heroism that could not be lived out turned into a call that could be lived out. God wills it. In this fiction, enormous tensions were discharged. To the astonishment of a posterity that can discover neither military nor economic nor religious reasons in the unspoke, unspeakable torments and shows of bravado in the Crusades. The idea of the Crusade offers, besides the persecution of witches, anti Semitism, and fascism, one of the strongest examples of how an officially proclaimed collective mania saved countless individuals in whom the conflicts between religious love and militarism churned from going privately mad. Since 1096, the holy war functions in Western civilizations as a safety valve. Under the pressure of their own inner contradictions and madnesses, people have since then sought external, diabolical enemies and have waged the holiest of wars against them. The psychogram of Christian civilizations carries this proto-fascist risk within it. In times of crisis, when the unlivability of opposed ethical programmings becomes to be felt more acutely, a moment regularly arrives when the pressure explodes. That the persecution of Jews in the Rhineland simultaneously with the Crusades underlies the interconnections between the various cultural pathological phenomena. Jews, heretics, witches, antichrists and reds are all victims of a primarily inner formation of fronts that emerge during highly schizoid periods of pressure when the irrationality of the whole society seeks an outlet for contradictory ethics. In addition to channeling Christian masters cynicism into the Crusades, the Middle Ages showed a second way out of the tension. A semi-secularised courtly sphere was set up, which the ethos of the aristocracy and the military could be indulged in with a free conscience. The early Arthurian legend was nourished by the momentum released by this discovery. Chivalrous romances like the Chanson de Geste pro pretty clearly gave the heroic ethos priority over the Christian ethos. Here, chivalry removed itself a couple of steps from the chains of the Christian commandment to be loving and peaceful by indulging in an autonomous, worldly celebration of skill and the use of weapons. Pardon me. Courtly festivity and a refined erotics. Not caring what the priests had to say about it. The culture of Tournaments, feasts, hunting, gluttonous banquets, chivalrous love. Aristocratic hedonism played a significant role in the 19th century by protecting the worldly joy and living from the masochistic aura of Christian monasteries. He who slew the most opponents and conquered the most beautiful woman had considered the grandest, was considered the grandest fellow. Even Nietzsche, in his anti-Christian song of praise for the blonde beast and powerful figures, had in mind such secularised rowdy aristocrats, later condottieri, the type of men who act, take what they desire and can be splendidly ruthless. <laughs>
The courtly neo-heroism, however, achieved only an illusory emancipation from Christian ethics. In a more sublime way, Arthur's knights were also, of course, Christian knights. This is obvious in the case of Percival. With the myth of the knight in search of the Holy Grail, the Christianization of the military is extended into metaphorical and allegorical spheres, and ultimately stripped of reality in a pure mysticism of chivalry that absorbs combat into spiritual dimensions. During the late Burgundian period, chivalrous culture resembled a literature living itself out. In the symbolic haze of Christianized ideologies of the empire, the knight and the state during the late Middle Ages, which hovered over the incessant feudal city, church and state wars of Europe, Machiavelli's ideas must have had, a cleansing, had the cleansing effect of a storm. Machiavelli's prints has always been read, especially in bourgeois times, as the greatest testament to the cynical technique of power as an insurpassable declaratory oath of political unscrupulousness, it was indicted on moral grounds. What religion fundamentally and unconditionally condemns, murder, is here openly recommended as political means. Of course, over the centuries, many have employed this means. This is not what is innovative in Machiavelli's doctrine. But that someone now comes forth and advocates it openly, that creates a new moral standard that can be sensibly treated only under the concept of cynicism. Master's consciousness arms itself for a new round, and in doing so, checks the supplies. Someone was almost bound to come along and express the new standard unmistakably, cheekily, unrestrainedly, clearly, etc., the act of expressing, even to the present day, is considered more scandalous than what is expressed. Machiavelli's political amoralism presupposes the unending tradition of war and the feudal and political chaos of the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. As a historian, Machiavelli saw that the last remnants of legitimation had been torn from the splendid gown of the Christian state since no ruler was any longer in a position to fulfil, even illusorily, the most primitive tasks of state, securing peace, upholding the law, protecting life, in the never-ending confusion of warring minor powers. Here, the thought of a central power presses to the fore, since it would be in a position to end the chaos of individual powers and to again make civil and state life possible. The ideal prince of such an imaginary, still non-existent central power would, without regard for the constraints and intricacies of Christian morality, have to learn the exercise, have to learn to exercise power radically as an effective force of law, peace and protection within a homogenized state territory. Politically, Machiavelli and his cynicism saw decidedly more clearly than the authorities of the land, empire and town in the late Middle Ages, who simply went on running things with a brutality cloaked in Christianity. The Florentines' prince theory posits for the statesman a duty to unconditional hegemonic power, whereby the disposal over every means is automatically implied. Such a cynical technology of power can be valid only in situations in which the state, the political vessel for survival, has been smashed, and the central power, if it still exists at all, has fallen into the role of a whipped dog with which a pack of brutal, greedy and chaotically quarrelling minor powers play their game. In such a situation, Machiavelli's cynicism can speak the truth. For a minute in world history, this is how a cheeky sovereign spirit sounds, who expresses precisely the right point in amoral tones, and can speak for more general vital interests. To be sure, this cynical consciousness of power is already so reflexively convoluted, 
and precariously unrestrained, that this voice cannot be readily understood, neither from above nor below, neither by those who wield power nor by the general population. A residue of uneasiness remains when a princely sovereignty is described here that does something good for itself and for the nation's people as a whole by risking, beyond good and evil, the most infamous crimes against individuals. One might think that the politics of the absolutist states and territories in 17th and 18th century Europe fulfilled Machiavelli's idea with a grain of salt. The absolutist state, indeed, set itself above the quarrelling minor powers, above regional sovereigns, and especially above the religious parties that were bloodily entangled in one another. The politicians were initially those who tried to manoeuvre tactfully and to remain relatively neutral vis-à-vis -vis the warring religious camps. But scarcely established as new, relatively stable hegemonic powers, the absolutist states began to present themselves in a cloud of self-adulation. They too did their utmost to veil their core of violence in a grandiose rhetoric of legality and God's grace. However, no amount of boastful claims on God's grace can make critical subjects completely forget that in reality, it is also a domination by the grace of murder and manslaughter, as well as oppression. No modern state has completely succeeded in masking its core of violence, as the utopia of legality dreams of doing. The first great resistance against the modern absolutist state was born, sensibly enough, by the former free high nobility and the landed aristocracy that feared the court's sovereignty. That is, a group of people who, because they themselves were all too arrogant, clearly perceived the arrogance of the central power. They could almost be written up as an unintended popular success of Machiavelli, who revealed the trade secrets for all modern central powers. The cynical amoralism of hegemonic powers can no longer be dismissed. Since then, states have lived in a cynical twilight of semi-legitimation and semi-presumption. A relative excess of violence, oppression and usurpation accompanies even those states most concerned about legitimacy and the rule of law. Under even the most solemnly sworn achievements of peace by a state, its military undergarments can be seen. Modern people say, as did the ancients, Si vis pacem parabellum, if you want peace, arm for war. Even in the best legal system, raw facts like class privileges, misuse of power, caprice and inequalities pierce through time and again. Behind the juridical fictions of the free exchange of goods, free labour contract and unregulated prices, inequalities in power and extortion come to light on all sides. Under the most sublime and free forms of aesthetic communication, the voices of social suffering and cultural barbarity still cry out. In this respect, Walter Benjamin's statement holds, there is no evidence of culture that is not simultaneously evidence of barbarism. Since the 18th century, the political atmosphere in Central Europe has been rife with open secrets. Partly discreetly, in a private or secret setting, partly in the form of an open pub publicistic aggression, the secrets of raw power are now given away. Power is once again supposed to answer to morality. The origin of absolutism and its political wisdom which was based on the stance's capability to suppress minor war and religious massacre, has here long since sunk into the dim past. Convinced that it would handle power in a morally unobjectionable way, if it only had power, the political moral critique of the 18th century resisted absolute despotism. A new social class, the bourgeoisie, now made itself under the name of the people, a candidate for the assumption of power, commoners, the third estate, etc. 
The French Revolution, in its regicidal phase, carried the government of the people to the summit of the political system. However, what had made the revolution in the name of the people established itself in the following era as the bourgeois aristocracy, as an aristocracy of finance, culture and entrepreneurship. Moreover, through marriage, it was interwoven a hundredfold with the older hereditary nobility. It could not be long before this new stratum of masters, which called itself the people and cited the sovereignty of the people as its legitimating principle, experienced the contradictions of ruling for itself. For those who use the people for legitimation, for those who use the people for legitimation call forth the people and invite them to take an active interest in the machinations that are employed in their name and against them. The contradictory nature of the Christianized state now repeats itself on a higher historical level. In the contradictions of the bourgeois state, which bases itself on the sovereignty of the people and makes the authorities dependent on universal elections, or makes it appear so, for just as little of the Christian state in the Middle Ages realized the Christian ethics of love, reconciliation and free fraternity, could the modern bourgeois states convincingly represent their maxims freedom, equality, fraternity, solidarity or even the vital interests of the broad masses? Let me try that, sta that statement again uh, with a better emphasis. Four. Just as little as the Christian state in the Middle Ages realized the Christian ethics of love, reconciliation and free fraternity could the modern bourgeois states convincingly represent their maxims, freedom, equality, fraternity, solidarity, or even the vital interests of the broad masses. Those who study the situation of the peasant populations in the 19th century, or even more, that of the growing industrial proletariat and the development of pauperism in the age of bourgeois rule, and in addition the situation of women, servants, minorities, etc. Those who do this must notice that a garbled and truncated concept of the people underlies the legitimating appeal to the people. At this point, socialist movements become possible and necessary. They demand that whatever happens in the name of the people should also happen through and for the people. Those who base their authority on the people must also serve the people. To start with, by not involving them in those murderous people's wars that were typical of that age when bourgeois or feudal bourgeois classes ruled in the name of the people <coughs> and ended by allotting them as a just and ended by allotting them a just proportion of the wealth they produce through their own labour. In the secular conflict of the socialist movements with, let us say, the bourgeois nation-state, two new turnings and polemical reflexive convolutions of political consciousness were perpetrated that, to a large extent, govern the 20th century. Both are late, complex forms of cynical consciousness. The first is what we call fascism. It goes so far as to confess in a relatively unabashed way its allegiance to a politics of pure violence. In a cynical manner it simply dispenses with the effort of legitimation by openly proclaiming brutality and holy egoism to be political necessities and historical biological laws. Hitler's contemporaries found him to be a great orator because among other reasons, he began to articulate with a clear tone of naked realism that which had displeased the German temperament for a long time, and that which it had wanted to do away with in accordance with its narcissistic and brutal ideas of order, namely the hopeless Weimar parliamentarianism, the infamous Treaty of Versailles, etc., and in particular the guilty ones and the troublemakers, Socialists, communists, trade unionists, anarchists, modern artists, gypsies, homosexuals, but above all the Jews, who had to bear the brunt of all of it, for 
being the intimate enemy and universal projection figure. Why precisely them? What is the meaning of this uniquely malicious animosity? Through the mass murder of the Jews, the fascists sought to smash the mirror that the Jewish people, by their mere existence, held up to fascist arrogance. For the fascist, the heroically arrogant nobody, capital N nobody, must have felt that no one saw through him more than did the Jews, who by virtue of their tradition of suffering, almost as if by nature, stands in ironic juxtaposition to every superior power. The central figures of German fascism must have sensed that their arrogant thousand-year Reich would never be able to believe in itself as long as there remained in a corner of their own consciousness the memory that this pretension to power was a mere pose. It was the Jews who reminded the fascists of this. Anti-Semitism betrayed the kink in the fascists' will to power. This power would never become so great that it would overcome the cynical Jewish denial of it. The quote-unquote impudent Jew became the catchword for beating, stabbing and murdering. Schlag, stitch und Mordwort under fascism. Out of its legacy of resigned resistance, covered over by apparent accommodation, Modern Judaism radiated such an intense negation of the arrogance of power into the centre of fascist consciousness that the German fascists, bent on their own grandiosity, built extermination camps in order to eliminate what stood in the way of their presumptuousness. Did not these people live with the melancholy knowledge that all messiahs since time immemorial had been false? How could the German messiah out of the Austrian night asylum, who let himself be celebrated as the returned Barbarossa from Kifhäuserberger, believe in his own mission, as long as he himself looked over his shoulder with the eyes of the evil Jew who undermines everything. No will to power can endure the irony of the will to survive this power too. No will to power can endure the irony of the will to survive this power too. To be sure, it is inadmissible simply to characterise the fascist state of the 20th century as the typical representative of the modern bourgeois state based on the sovereignty of the people. Nevertheless, fascism develops one of the latent possibilities of the bourgeois people's state. Its rampant anti-socialism makes it clear that there is in fascism a political phenomenon of disinhibition, namely a master cynical defensive reaction against the impudent socialist demand to let people have what they were promised, what is due to them. Fascism, it is true, also wants everything for the people, but first it swindles through its false concept of the people. The people is monolith as a homogenous mass that obeys a single will. One people, one Reich, one Führer. With this, liberal ideology is given a good, swift lesson. Individual freedoms, individual will, individual opinion, Eigensinn, nonsense. And this nonsense is all the more annoying the further down it appears. Fascism realises the tendency of the bourgeois state to push through with the necessary force the particular interests of the whole rather than individual interests. In doing this, it distinguishes itself through its unrestrained brutality. For this reason, it could occur to some substantial non-fascist interest groups with political influence in the economy and parliament to support the fascists when they seized state power and to think of them perhaps as a new broom with which disruptive individual interests down below could be thoroughly swept away. Were there really people who were cynical enough to believe that they could buy off Hitler and his cynical party of brutality? One of them, 
fists in, in fact wrote memoirs under the title I Paid Hitler. The fascist state, with its stifling confusion of capital and folk ideology, idealisms and brutalities, deserves a unique philosophical predicate, the cynicism of cynicism. The second complicated convolution of modern political consciousness occurred in recent Russian history. There seems to be a tendency for the militance and radicalness of socialist movements to develop proportionally to the level of oppression in a country. The more powerful a workers' movement was able to become in Europe, especially in Germany, corresponding to the real growth of the proletariat and the process of industrialization, the more established, bourgeois, it presented itself in its average political behaviour the more it trusted in a gradual victory over its opponents, the forces of the late feudal and bourgeois state. Conversely, the more powerful and unconquerable a despotic feudal state power really was, the more fanatically it was confronted by the socialist opposition. One might try to express it in the following way. The riper a country was for the insertion of socialist elements into its social order, high development of productive forces, high degree of employment of wage labour, high degree of organisation of proletarian interests, etc. The more calmly the leaders of the workers' movement waited for their chance, the strength and weakness of the social democratic principle was always its pragmatic patience. Conversely, the less riper society was for socialism, thought of as post-capitalism, the more unrelentingly and successfully radical socialism knew how to place itself at the head of subversive movements. If there is a law governing the logic of struggle that says that in long conflicts opponents assimilate each other, then this law has been substantiated in the conflicts between the Russian communists and the Tsarist despots. What was played out between 1917, pardon me, and the 20th Party Congress must be understood as the cynical and ironical testament of Tsarism. Lenin became the testamentary executor of a despotism whose representatives had possibly been extinguished, but not its procedures and inner structures. Stalin raised the traditional despotism to the technological level of the 20th century in a way that would have made any Romanov blanch. If, under the Tsars, the Russian state was already a much too tightly fitting shirt for its society, under the Communist Party it became a real straitjacket. If under Tsarism a tiny group of the privileged held an enormous empire terroristically under control through the apparatus of power, after 1917, it was a tiny group of professional revolutionaries who, riding the wave of disgust with the war and hatred of the, riding the wave of disgust with the war, and the hatred the peasants and proletariat had for those at the top, overthrew Goliath. But was Leon Trotsky not, as a Jew? the inheritor of an ancient tradition of resistance and self-assertion against arrogant power? Trotsky had to let himself be banished and murdered by his colleague, who had become the Goliath. Is not, in Stalin's murder of Trotsky, the same cynical reply of presumptuous hegemonic power at work as in fascist genocide? In both cases, it is a matter of the revenge of presumptuous force on those whom it knows will never respect it. But rather, for all time, will cry out to the bugaboo, legitimate yourself, or you will be overpowered. In Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution was hidden something of the knowledge that political force must justify itself every time it is used in order to differentiate itself from criminality. Power must prove that it is a force for peace, law and protection within its territory in order to make possible a new, new abundance of autonomous life.
The idea of a permanent revolution is not an appeal for continual chaos, but stands rather as a code for the Jewish consciousness that every mere arrogance of state will be humbled, even if it means by being reminded of its crimes for as long as it exists. If Russian resistance even today expresses itself in the language of Christian and human rights, it does so because the process of self-liberation in Russia came to a halt at that point where it had arrived between February and the Red October of 1917. The demand for human rights is the universal formula of bourgeois freedoms. A country that wants to leap over the liberal phase will, when it jumps from despotism to socialism, land back in despotism again. The Russian people let themselves be made into the tools of a future that never wanted to arrive, and that, after all that has happened, can no longer come in a way that it was promised. It has sacrificed its rights to life and its demand of reason for the present. In an act of orthodox masochism and scared confessional torment, on the altars of consumption of distant generations, it has exhausted its vital energies in the race to catch up to the madness of consumption and Western weapons technology. As far as the real socialist apparatus of state is concerned, most observers assure us that ideologically it has been in the meantime totally drained. Everyone feels the gulf between the phraseology of the Leninist tradition and everyday experiences particularly those who are forced to speak this phraseology because of their position. The world falls into two separate dimensions. One reckons everywhere with a split reality. Reality begins where the state and its terminology end. The conventional concept of lie does not adequately describe the situation in the East with its floating, schizoid diffusions of reality. For everyone knows that the relation between the words and the things is disrupted. But without control through public discussion, the disruption establishes itself as a new normality. People therefore no longer define themselves in terms of socialist values or ideals. Rather their definitions proceed from the lack of any alternative or escape from what is really given. That is, from a socialism that one endures like an evil together with its radiantly true, but unfortunately only rhetorical, side. If cynicism, according to the prototype of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor, can turn into tragedy, then it does so here, where the word socialism, which everywhere else in the world delineates a hope for people to become the masters of their own lives, is frozen into a symbol of futility. This represents a cynical speech disturbance of epochal proportions. Even from the outside it is obvious that the politics of the socialist powers no longer holds any hope of socialism whatsoever. In Marxist-Leninist terminology, the East exemplifies naked hegemonic politics. And one hesitates to laugh or hiss only because one cannot know what would happen when the emperor notices that he has been walking naked across the street for a long time now. The other also has long been this way, but what will happen when it becomes known? Why has the greatest military power in the world been built up in order to protect a fictive otherness? Now, readers note fictive in the sense of fictional here. I'm pretty sure that's what he means. If we try to imagine what a Machiavelli at the end of the 20th century would say after a careful study of the political situation, it would probably be a cynical piece of advice to the superpowers to de declare with unscrupulous openness the bankruptcy of the systems on both sides. First, to motivate each to aid the other. Second, to move their politically tired subjects to a great offensive of inventive self-help, and third, because the bankruptcy has um, has probably in and third, because the bankruptcy has probably in fact come about, 
If we try to imagine what a Machiavelli at the end of the 20th century would say after a careful study of the political situation, it would probably be a cynical piece of advice to the superpowers to declare with unscrupulous openness the bankruptcy of the systems on both sides. First, to motivate each to aid the other. Second, to move their politically tired subjects to a great offensive of inventive self-help. And third, because the bankruptcy has probably in fact come about. As a good positivist, Machiavelli would observe that a majority of the so-called political problems around the year 2000 are illusory problems, stemming from the antagonism between two power blocks that confront each other, because one of them tried to organise a social system that bypasses capitalism without having ever really known it. The other is a brittle, old, overripe capitalism that cannot go beyond itself, because the house named socialism, into which it could move, is already occupied. Accordingly, the competition between East and West is, Machiavelli would recite this with his well-known dry malice, neither a productive competition between powers in the usual sense, nor a classic hegemonic rivalry, but rather an aborted conflict of a complicated type. Socialism has become the chief hindrance to capitalism's transition to it. At the same time, the capitalism of the West, nailed down in this way, is its own chief hindrance to an open joining with systems in the East. Thus, while the East systematically lives beyond its means by pretending to be socialism, the West systematically does not live up to its potential because it has to formulate its ideas of the future defensively. Namely, under no circumstances does it want this socialism. Which is understandable, because no system can take what it has long since surpassed as its goal. For capitalism, a disguised and crippled state capitalism of the Eastern type cannot be an idea for the future. If we want to resolve the conflict, we must have a precise understanding of this uniquely paradoxical type of conflict. On this point, Machiavelli would concur with the views of his colleague Marx, who provided the initial steps for a universal, historical political, polemic. This Marxian universal polemic allows us to differentiate between conflicts based on rivalry between similar systems and conflicts based on evolutionarily dissimilar systems differing from each other in a degree of their development. In the latter case, the conflict is between the less developed and the more developed system, whereby the latter necessarily grows out of the former. Ideally, the conflict between capitalism and socialism is of the latter kind. Seen logically, it can only be a conflict of overcoming in which the old resists the new, even though the latter undeniably emerges out of the former. The new becomes necessary when the old has become a fetter. This is precisely what Marx assures us of becoming, uh, assures us of concerning the essence of fully developed capitalism. Once it has first become completely developed, it becomes itself a barrier to the human productivity that it had previously impelled. This barrier must be lifted. Socialism. Socialism on all levels releases human productivity from its restrictive capitalist conditions, i.e., above all, from capitalist property relations. If we now observe what presents itself today as the conflict between capitalism and socialism, it can be seen at once that this is in no way the conflict between the old and the new studied by Marx, but is instead a conflict based on the rivalry between two empires. Thus, nothing new under the sun? What is new arises through the turning of this rivalry about its own sociological and historical axis. The Marxist attempt to guide history through socio-economic insight has led to a complete distortion of historical perspectives on the future as a whole.
the claims to control the history of the system, instead of letting it take its known course, has brought it drastically out of step. For indeed, the future of capitalism is not an eternally new capitalism, but rather something grows out of it, and out of its achievements that comes after it, overcomes it, inherits it, and will make it into prehistory. In a word, it makes possible its own ascent into a post-capitalism. And if we call this socialism, then what this means should now be clearly enough defined from all points of view. After capitalism, grown out of an overripe capitalism. Now, one must not dream that one could force the development simply because one has recognised these interconnections. What gave Lenin the right to believe, or want to believe, that Russia offered a case for the application of this Marxist theory of development and revolution will remain a puzzle. The puzzle lies not in Lenin's authentic revolutionary motivations, but in the way in which he forced the application of a Western political economic theory on a semi-Asiatic, scarcely industrialised agrarian empire. I believe there can be no other answer. Here was an absolute will to revolution in search of a halfway suitable theory, and when it became evident that the theory was not really appropriate due to the lack of real preconditions for its application, a compulsion to falsify, reinterpret and distort arose out of the determination to apply it. In Lenin's hands, Marxism became a theory of legitimation for an attempt to violently force reality to a point at which later the preconditions for the application of Marxian theory would be given, namely in late capitalist relations that would thus be ripe for revolution. How? Through forced industrialization. To the present day, the Soviet Union is in search of the causes of the Second Revolution of 1917. It would like, in a sense, to provide, after the fact, the necessity for a socialist revolution, and if all signs do not deceive us, it is on the best road for doing just that. For it is there, as in scarcely any other country, that, in Marx's formulation, the relations of production have become a fetter to the productive forces. If this incongruity provides the general formula for a revolutionary tension, then it is given here in an exemplarily crass form. Exemplarily. That was hard to say, man. What in the current world situation as a conflict within the system presents itself in an absurd way as a conflict between two systems? At the same time, this externalised conflict between the systems has become the main fetter to the liberation of human productivity. The so-called system conflicts, the so-called system conflict, takes place between two mystified mystifiers. By means of a paranoid politics of armament, two real illusory opponents force themselves to maintain an imaginary system difference solidified through self-mystification. In this way, a socialism that does not want to be capitalism and a capitalism that does not want to be socialism paralyse each other. Moreover, the conflict confronts a socialism that practices more exploitation than capitalism in order to hinder the latter with a capitalism that is more socialist than socialism in order to hinder the latter. In the spirit of the Marxian universal polemic, Machiavelli would conclude that the developmental conflict has been neutralised by an externalised, distorted, hegemonic conflict. Two giants of production expend enormous amounts of their socially produced wealth to solidify militarily a demarcation of systems that is basically untenable. Thus, as we said at the end of the 20th century, Machiavelli would probably recommend a general declaration that the systems are bankrupt. This declaration must precede so-called disarmament, for what causes the systems to arm is the idea 
that they are fundamentally opposed and that they each want something quite different that must be defended at all costs. Relaxation of tension through disarmament. That is yet again one of those fatally dangerous mystifications that sees everything in inverted order. Relaxation of tension can only happen as an uncramping from within. That is as insight into the fact that the only thing we have to lose is the unbearable armed illusion of a difference between systems. Perhaps Machiavelli would again write a small pamphlet on the art of governing, this time not under the title The Prince, but under the heading On the Weak State. Posterity would doubtless again agree that this brochure is a scandal. Machiavelli perhaps would not have entirely stripped off his Florentine humanism, and would thus write a treatise in the form of a dialogue between two partners, David and Goliath. A passage from it might read as follows. Well, Goliath, always fit, always ready for a fight. I hope you're in shape for another duel. Well, how unfair, David. You can see I'm somewhat indisposed today. Well, how come? Uh, it's a long story. I love stories. How would it be if for today we tell stories instead of duelling? The winner would be the one who can tell the crazier story, or the condition that it, on the condition that it's true. Do you want to begin? Hmm, if you like. Stories as a substitute for fighting. What a funny idea. Okay, let me think. Well... Some time ago, something happened that unsettled me so much that I can still scarcely relax. You know, after the Great War, I defeated the giant Kaput and wiped out his entire following. It was quite an achievement, for there was a lot of them, and it wasn't easy for me to track them all down. They were artfully hidden. They had artfully hidden themselves in my own ranks. In the end, I created calm and order, and everything seemed to run smoothly. One day I met a giant who, upon seeing me, at once cried, You are kaput, I will conquer you. And thereupon he began a horrifying arms build-up. In vain I tried to make it clear to him that I was not kaput, because I had killed him with my own hands. But he would have none of it. Incessantly he piled up the most frightening tools of war so as to be armed against me, whom he held to be the murderous kaput. He armed without let-up so that I myself had no choice but to arm without stopping. Nothing I said could convince him that I was not Kaput. He nailed me down to it. Both of us were convinced that Kaput was terrible and had to be subdued at all costs, but I could not make him see that I was not Kaput. Well, indeed, in time I myself became uncertain whether I had killed the real Kaput. Perhaps the one I slew was not Kaput at all. Perhaps this guy, the one who was attacking me and trying to drive me mad by insisting that I am kaput. Perhaps he is kaput. Yeah, but I won't let him get the better of me. I'm on my guard. We spy on each other day and night. Our fleets are always on the seas and our planes are constantly in the air so as to be able to strike the instant the other makes a move. I don't know who he is. And I still maintain that he's confusing me with someone else. You know, perhaps even intentionally. In any case, the one thing that is certain is that we are arming against each other, and keep on arming and arming. Well, that really is a nasty story. I'll have to exert myself to find a crazier one. And you also maintain that it's true. Oh, absolutely. I wish it were made up. I'm sure things could then be only half as bad for me, because of all this armament. I'm on the point of throwing up. I can't even move around freely anymore because of all the armour and electronic contacts that would set off the bombs if they were touched. Damn. Well then, you can't even really fight anymore. You'd only blow yourself to smithereens. Why didn't you tell me that in the first place? I almost tangled with you just now. Just like back then when you were still a real opponent. Ugh, before I would have punched you in the mouth for such cheeky talk. But somehow you're right. As an opponent, I'm useless now. To tell you the truth, I'm already so miserable that I don't know how to go on. 
Every night brings nightmares that take their toll on my nerves. Nothing but bombs, craters, corpses. I feel like I'm suffocating. And to think I wanted to brawl with someone like that. You're no giant, you're a basket case. Are you finished? Uh, not quite. Since we're on the subject, you may as well hear something. Recently I've been having the same nightmare. I dream that I'm a mouse who wants to die because life has simply become too much for it. I look for a cat that will do me the favour. I sit down in front of the cat and try to get it interested in me. But it remains lethargic. Well that's not fair of you, I say to the cat, for I'm still young and must taste pretty good especially since I've been well fed. But the cat, a blasé beast, merely answers, I'm well nourished too, so why should I bother? It wouldn't be normal. Finally, with great difficulty, I talk the cat into it. I'll help you out this way, it says. Put your head in my mouth and wait. I do what it says, and then I ask, will it take long? The cat replies, just as long as it takes for someone to step on my tail. It must be a reflex action. But don't worry, I'll stretch my tail out. So that is death, I think to myself, my head in a cat's mouth. The cat stretches out its bushy tail across the sidewalk. I hear steps. I squint sideways. What do I see? Twelve little blind girls from the Pope Julius orphanage come singing down the street. Almighty oh, God! At this moment I usually wake up bathed in sweat, as you can imagine. Well, that's it. What do you mean? You have won. I can't top your story. It makes me shudder, the state you're in. <laughs> really? Well now, a victory in storytelling. That is something after all. Yeah, perhaps it will be your last. Anyone as big as I am will still often win. Big? What's that?